And it's a great pleasure to introduce Barros, who's a longtime colleague of SIDS at Yale and a, a neighbor of mine in Hamden. Um, so uh, Sparrows left Yale to go to Harvard and then on to Biogen. And he's famous for discovering the notch signaling pathway, which is a very important pathway which he discovered in uh, fruit flies that controls epithelial cell differentiation and proliferation. And um, what we now know is that it also controls development in humans and is dysregulated in cancer and is being t seen as a target for cancer therapy. So I think it's a nice illustration how basic research can lead in directions that were totally unpredictable and something that we can uh, uh, want to continue to support. And of course, Sid himself has continued to do that. He's ba based on his work on RNASP. He's developing methods to uh, regulate gene expression and prevent or treat human diseases, including malaria and influenza. So with that, I'm happy to introduce Spiros. Thank you. So Sid, uh, this is a, uh, a picture of uh, the Yale Bulletin. Uh, when uh, Sid was awarded the Nobel Prize. And uh, I think that uh, it's still hanging on my desk. Since, uh, since then, it is still hanging on my desk. So, Sid, uh, <laughs> a monomer, is it? Um, so, this is hanging on my desk still, Sid. And uh, I just, it's an honor and a pleasure. And this is the truth to be here. And uh, thank you for. Uh, almost, what, 35 years of friendship and science. So, uh, I could not come here, which is home in many ways, without talking about notch rather than anything else. Uh, both because I can't say anything else about anything else, uh, as well as, as, well as uh, this is, I think, appropriate at Yale to do that. So my story at Yale uh, started in 1980 when uh, this uh, person, Joe Gall, uh, found me in a Gordon conference and asked me whether I would be interested in coming at Yale. This resulted in a job interview. And um, uh, in that uh, interview, actually, which was successful, at least for me, I don't know if this uh, turned out to be successful for Yale, but, uh, uh, but uh, and uh, at, at the audience, actually, uh, I sit down to give my job talk and I see Fred Sanger there. So I'd done my PhD in... Uh, he was visiting Yale. So Fred was in front. I had done my PhD at uh, the MRC, where I first met august people like uh, Tom and Roger. And actually, I remember Mark Tashne, who came for a few months at the MRC to see that, make sure that uh, Magnatis was doing the right experiments, I suppose. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, um, and I came to Yale uh, armed uh, with a chromosome break. Uh, that was breaking into the notch, uh, to the notch locus. Um, now, notch uh, has, was a gene that was first discovered in 1914 by Dexter in, uh, in Morgan's lab. <coughs> and uh, it was, as you can see, it has a little bit of notches there. This is hap it's a haploinsufficient gene. That's why it's called notch. Um, and um, the gene stayed sort of in limbo, if you will, genetically for a long time. Uh, but it became uh, quite uh, a star in developmental genetics by this man, uh, uh, Don Poulsen, whose lab actually I took over when I came to Yale. This is a, a picture that I took from Don uh, in 1985. And uh, the remarkable thing about Don was that he was probably the first person to link genes with development. Now, you, most of, especially younger people, I uh, will never know that uh, that genes were thought, you know, the kind of genes that Morgan, uh, this weird bunch of people that was uh, around Morgan that was studying, were, uh, are, were relevant only for terminal traits, like the wing of the fly and so on, and, but not for embryogenesis, not for morphogenesis. So Don was uh, the first person, actually, to my knowledge, uh, to link that. This is his thesis in Caltech, advisors Sturdivant and Dovjansky. And uh, he actually says that, uh, there, that there's no differentiation. If you, if you have lots of function of notch, you lack the differentiation of the ectoderm at the expense of hypodermal structures. So it was this differential, uh, this uh, kind of switch. So um, he did, uh, uh, Don, uh, uh, deficiency mapping. And he had mapped a notch around the 3C7 region of the X chromosome. 
And Bill Welchon was the only lab uh, that was working on notes when I started working on it. It was one lab. Uh, was doing fine structure cytogenetics, and he had mapped uh, three C's, I mean, uh, notch, the notch locus, right at 3C7. So we used uh, chromosome walking and jumping uh, in Dave Hognes' lab in, uh, in Stanford uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, clone the breakpoint. And that was my, my job, uh, that was the, the thing that I was going to set up my lab on. Um, as I said, uh, notch signaling, notch, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the phenotype of notch uh, was becoming very important because if you had lack of notch, you would see a switch in differentiation. So things that were supposed to become neuroblasts were switching fate and becoming uh, uh, um, dermoblasts. So this kind of switch was, was something uh, quite interesting, obviously. So armed with the, uh, the breakpoint, um, we went ahead and cloned uh, the entire locus. Turned out to be 2,700 amino acid protein, transmembrane, with 836 EGF repeats uh, outside. Uh, I submitted the paper in, on Friday, and good old Benji Lewin called Monday. It's, I was actually not, not Benji Lewin, it was one of the editorial people, and said, do you want this figure to be this way or this way? I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I could not believe it. Of course, Benji Lewin, as usual, he was excited about the wrong thing. Um, he was excited, uh, but he was excited, so which was, I, I was at the good end of the stick at this point. Um, and uh, he was excited about the EGF repeats because the EGF repeats was the first time that EGF was sort of linked with, uh, with lower eukaryotes, I mean, if you will. Um, so uh, we, but the important thing for us was not that. It was that it was a transmembrane protein and uh, that, because that implied the existence of a cell interaction mechanism. Something on the outside that the protein talks to and something on the inside. And that's, so that, uh, that's how uh, my story sort of started with, uh, with notch. Um, notch signaling turned out to be one of the, uh, one of the seven or eight, or you want to plus or minus pathways that govern uh, essentially um, uh, embryonic morphogenesis. Uh, that was mostly through the work of, uh, the beautiful work of uh, Janine Nusslein and, uh, and her colleagues. But, uh, but I think that, you know, so not turned out to be a very fundamental, if you will, pathway in, uh, for embryonic morphogenesis. Everything, flies, humans, Vitruvian or otherwise, uh, are governed by these, by these rather simple, if you will, uh, um, interaction uh, uh, signaling pathways. So um, the, what is clear, however, uh, is that, uh, that notch uh, affects, it's complex. So it's actually quite appropriate that I talk after you because you talk about specificity and I could say my talk called pleiotropy, if you will, which is in a sense the opposite of this. I'm familiar with the Simon book. It's a great, great book. Uh, but I interpret it in a somewhat different way uh, to explain or rather to justify pleiotropy, which is the other side of the coin in many ways. Uh, anyway, uh, multiple tissues are affected by notch activity, uh, multiple developmental stages, uh, and, uh, and multiple developmental events, and uh, it affects differentiation, it affects proliferation, it affects movements, uh, and it affects apoptosis. So all the ingredients that are necessary to make, hello Ian, <laughs> uh, to make a, uh, a, a three-dimensional structure, or make, make, it, make an organism. So, uh, a few things, how does it do it? Uh, first of all, the developmental logic of notch is, in spite of its extraordinary pleiotropy, and I'll come back to that again and again, uh, the developmental logic is rather simple. Uh, what notch does is, is links the fate of one cell that miraculously acquires it somehow uh, to the next door neighbors. That's what it does. No matter where, where, in what species, in what, that's what it does. And, uh, and how does it, and that has profound consequences in morphogenesis. The first one is that it is responsible for lineage segregation. So you have a sea of, of cells that are similar or equivalent, and then one decides to become something, and the consequence of that decision 
is saying to the other ones, you become X or you don't become anything or whatever, all right? Uh, the second thing is one of the pathways, one of the pathways that controls uh, 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 borders. Both of these uh, events, obviously, quite important if you build up a, a, a three-dimensional uh, organism. Well, how does it do that? What is, again, the basic kind of logic? Well, it is that, uh, that notch, uh, the notch pathway uh, is actually, uh, where's the, is that the, oops, 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 oops. what did I do? I did something so stupid. Okay, uh, where's the pointer? Oh, there it is, there it is, there it is. <laughs> well, um, so um, it does it by, by essentially having a membrane-bound receptor that talks to a membrane-bound ligand on the other side of the cell. Uh, and over the years, uh, we have been trying to dissect the pathway, as you will see, not very successfully, as, uh, as you will, I will go on. But the, the, basic, the basic elements of the, the core pathway is you have a ligand on one cell. The ligand interacts physically, and we have characterized this by chemistry, uh, of, with the receptor. And the consequence of that is the cleavage of the, of the intracellular domain, which translocates into the nucleus, and then does its job transcriptionally. Uh, it it, uh, it, uh, it uh, uh, associates with a receptor, with a, uh, with a repressor, with a uh, activator, and so on, and it, it, uh, it controls uh, not uh, transcription. One element that I want to mention to you uh, is that essentially all of this pathway, all of the core, uh, was done uh, here at Yale, I mean, over the years. I mean, over 17 years, mind you, right? It wasn't overnight, okay? Um, so, uh, one aspect of notch that I want to mention which I think is crucial in terms of trying to give you an overview of the, of the pathway. Uh, if you look at two cells that are equivalent, I told you, um, what happens is that if you look at the receptor and the, the expression of the receptor and the ligand, they actually very often are equivalent. So you have two things. It's, it's both, uh, they express both the receptor and the ligand. And the question is, you know, what is, which cell will become the receiving versus the, the signaling uh, cell? Absolutely a crucial decision, all right? So, uh, so what, what's happening, f uh, for reasons, I mean, you have one cell that may have a small difference between the ligand and the receptor, and then through a very complicated, as we'll see, uh, uh, feedback loops and ex external uh, influences and so on, eventually what happens is the cell that ends up with more ligand, with more ligand, becomes the, the signaling cell, the one that, as with more receptor, it becomes the, uh, the receiving cell. That, of course, uh, implies, all right, that anything that will influence the number of receptors and the number of ligands on the surface is essentially, a potentially, a controlling uh, mechanism uh, for knots, all right? So all the trafficking events that you can imagine could be used, uh, theoretically, either the, the receptor and the ligand traveling to the, to the, to the surface, how it is uh, the stability, the ubiquitization of, of uh, how, how, you know, how stable the protein is and so on. So, um, so I think that uh, what I will, I will do from now onwards is really tell you how we have been trying to deconvolute the complexity. Because the, uh, uh, the, the, the core that I showed you, which is in textbooks, um, is deceptively simple. But when I say deceptively, it's D with a big, uh, you know, uh, capital, capital D, really, all right? Uh, and this is work that covers from 85 to 2016, which is a long time, even if you take uh, into account stupidity and incompetence. Uh, you still, I mean, you know, this is, it, uh, even, even with that, uh, it, is, uh, it is a complex problem, all right? So, let me go through some examples of the, uh, to show you the complexity of the locus, all right? Um, again, at Yale, by Tian, Tian Shu, who is a professor at, uh, of genetics in, uh, uh, here uh, now, was my graduate student. Uh, he found through a genetic, uh, a genetic analysis, Deltex, which is a it turned out to be a ubiquitous gaze that associates with notch, 
ubiquity lattice and as affects its stability, all right? Uh, in trying to, to, uh, to look at the circuitry that exists and, and, uh, and controls knots, uh, we found uh, some later years that uh, Kurtz, which is the, the uh, fly equivalent of the non-visual beta arrestant, associates with deltex, and it is this association that accelerates the destruction of knots. So if you express deltex and Kurtz, you destroy knots very fast, okay? And uh, the consequence of that is that you have these loss of function phenotypes, which you are all familiar with by now, all right? You add knots, it's loss of function, all right? Now, what happens if you look at, if you take this phenotype here, which is a double phenotype, really, uh, it's a double, uh, it's a, it expresses deltex and Kurtz, and what happens if you ask the question, how can I influence that phenotype? How can I modulate that phenotype? The tool is genetic screens. Modu uh, 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 modifier screens, and uh, if you do that, uh, what? Oh, before I say that, well, let me make one more point. Um, yeah. So if you loss of function of uh, of Kurtz, I told you that uh, gain of function of Kurtz. So if you express Kurtz and deltex, you downregulate knots. Uh, so if you do that, uh, you can see actually uh, in a mosaic here, this dark uh, patch here is Kurtz minus. Right? So if you don't have Kurtz, you upregulate the, the, uh, the protein. You make more protein. The thing here is that in spite of the fact that you make much more protein here, if you look at the downstream elements, the transcriptional activity of knots, the signaling of knots using a, 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 a marker, you can see that in this patch here, only, only part of it uh, knots is activated. So the context dependence of activation uh, is just just make that uh, make, make that uh, at that point. So how complex is the circuitry that uh, that actually governs these kinds of interactions? Again, as I said uh, uh, earlier, uh, genetic screens to look ask the question: If I mutate genes in the genome, or every gene in the genome, or 60% of the genes in the genome, which is the actual number, um, uh, and I combine it with that, do I see suppressors or enhancers? And the answer is yes. I can see both suppressors, so I'm making this phenotype better, and, uh, and, and enhancer. So there are, now the, the kind of bad news, if you will, uh, is that if you look at how many we got, uh, there are 120, 140 of these things. If you look at the logic of what kind of proteins are capable of modulating that phenotype, there's no rhyme and reason, it's everything is there, okay? Complexity, first sort of hint. Um, uh, asking, we asked two interrelated questions. Uh, one by Mark Kankel, and the reason I say Mark Kankel is because the son of Doug Kankel, where is, I don't know if Doug is here. There is Doug. He's doing very well still. Um, and, uh, and Greg Harrow was, was a graduate student, Mark was a postdoc. Uh, and the question was, you know, how complex is the circuitry? Now, I told you that if you, uh, if you down regulate knots, you see these wing notches. Now, if you, if you, if you ask the question, how many genes are capable of actually modulating that phenotype, so interacting genetically, um, so we engineer something that is lots of function knots, and then ask the question, how many genes can you see that can modulate the phenotype, either enhancing it or suppressing it, just genetic interaction? And the answer was ridiculous. There's about 500 genes. It's almost 5% of the genome almost. Uh, again, uh, sort of complexity. Uh, I should also say that each one of those genes, if you want to analyze that, it's one postdoc. Uh, it's the life of a postdoc, all right? So I just want to tell you. So how complex uh, is the integration of these, of these uh, pathways? So in this particular screen, Mark found two new interactors, E5 and MIR. It doesn't matter what they are. It doesn't matter at all. Uh, and uh, we knew from the literature that MIR is interacting with Akit skewed. Uh, Notch interactors are, are interacting with uh, Akit skewed. And, and these uh, interactors actually also are known to inhibit uh, the Iroquois complex. It doesn't matter if you don't know what I'm talking about. It, it makes no difference. Please. Uh, so yeah. Yes, yes. So they don't overexpress. These are all overexpressed, correct which all the caveats 
that you can imagine. So um, we know that TGF beta has been associated before with MIR and, uh, and E5. We know that MIR5 has been associated with, uh, with Hedgehog. And we know that uh, MIR uh, is also has been interacting genetically with wingless. So you can see that the notch modulation can be modulated, if you will, or is actually associated with all of these pathways, which are the pathways that control uh, 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 morphogenesis, if you will. If we ask the question more directly, you take embryos, you activate RAS in two different developmental stages, and you activate NOTS simultaneously and individually and so on. And ask the question, how many, what do I see in terms of, of, of genes that are upregulated or downregulated only by simultaneous NOTS and RAS activation? And the, the answer is we found 235 237 genes, but the more important uh, 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 finding is A, that if you look in these 237 genes, you see members of the wind pathway, uh, the, uh, the, the RTK, nuclear receptor, notch, JAKSTAT, hedgehog, DPP. Again, interaction between notch and all these, uh, all these pathways. One other remarkable thing is that if you ask the question, uh, that what happens with the RAS and the and NOTS, 65% of the RAS targets, 65% of RAS targets are capable of being modulated by NOTS. Incredible uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, 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 interaction between, between uh, these two pathways. Now, um, if uh, NOTS, uh, NOTS, all uh, the NOTS signaling has been uh, deeply associated with, uh, with uh, tumorigenesis and proliferation. So we wanted to find out, first of all, to see whether or not uh, we can actually look at, again, these kinds of uh, uh, inter inter integration of uh, signaling vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, 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 tumors. And, uh, and I'll give you two examples of that. Uh, the first one is I want to say that in, uh, uh, NOTS has been directly implicated in, uh, in uh, 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 TOL lymphoblastic leukemias. So if you activate NOTS, you can actually cause TL lymphoblastic leukemias. But it has been also associated with a, a whole variety of solid tumors, not in a direct way. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. And we'll talk about mammary glands and the intestine. So if you activate NOTS using MMTV in this particular case uh, in a mouse, you can actually see almost with 100% penetrance, these adenomas that are being, uh, uh, that are, that are being formed uh, in, in almost all mammary glands. Ah, sorry, sorry. But what do I mean? Sorry, sorry, uh, absolutely. Yeah. What do I mean by notch activation? You actually express the intracellular domain. I told you that it's cleaved and it goes in. So we just express the intracellular domain, the signal that will trigger a transcription. That's what's activation. OK? Uh, so if you look at, if you express the intracellular domain, which is the oncogenic form, by the way, in TO leukemias and so on, uh, you can actually see these, uh, these, uh, these tumors. But these tumors are not bona fide adenocarcinomas. They are adenomas that actually still can respond to the normal apoptotic machinery that governs involution. But if, on the other hand, uh, and this, and then you take, and it, these are to be, these are uh, pregnancy dependent uh, tumors. And if you take the, the same mouse, this one here again, and put it through pregnancy, again these tumors form, and again they regress. But if you do it a few times, eventually they don't regress. And they become bona fide adenocarcinomas. And this is an example. This is the papillary form, which is the, the, uh, the, the benign form, let's say. Uh, and, uh, and you can see actually next to it, there is a, uh, there is a, a, a solid pattern which is typical of, uh, of adenocarcinomas. So it is essentially the, the uh, uh, NOTS activating NOTS, expressing the intracellular domain, will give you a hyperplastic condition, which then given uh, accumulates mutations that will make it. Uh, uh, so it is essentially the activation plus another mutation that will give you the, uh, the, oncogenic, uh, uh, the oncogenic phenotype. Same thing is true in the, uh, in the gut. Uh, in the intestine, 
Uh, this is, uh, if, you, if you activate, this is the wild type of the intestine. Uh, and these are the, this is the crypts here. Uh, if you activate notch in those crypts, you can actually see that uh, you, can, uh, you, you stimulate proliferation. And we know, uh, looking mechanistically now at this, uh, this, uh, this problem, that uh, this proliferation it depends on, not on uh, wing signaling. So if you, if you inhibit wing signaling, then this is not proliferating anymore. All right? Now, if you look at, um, if, you, if, you take, uh, if you take APC, which is the adenomatosis polyposis coli, that's why uh, and in a heterozygous form in humans, that's why we do colonoscopies, uh, uh, a heterozygous uh, uh, form will give you these adenomas. So if you take a mouse and you make, uh, uh, you make it heterozygous, what happens is that you essentially, uh, you are getting about five lesions per intestine, adenomas, not adenocarcinomas. And if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curve here, if you activate knots, nothing happens. Proliferates, but nothing happens in terms of uh, tumors. If you take APC over plus, the heterozygous condition, you get about five lesions. But if you add notch, activated notch, uh, then instead of, uh, of five lesions, you get 115 or 120 lesions. So you blow up the, the, uh, uh, the gut with adenomas, not adenocarcinomas, but that eventually, of course, become adenocarcinomas and the and they mice die. So the oncogenic uh, 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 properties, if you will, of not is not so directly, but it is in co cooperation, it is in coordination uh, with other things. How can we look at that in a bit more rational way? Well, flies again. Uh, we can ask, we can do a screen and ask the question, does, can I get, can I identify genes that with activated knots will actually induce proliferation? Simple question, so to speak. Um, so if you activate knots in the eye under the certain uh, uh, genetic conditions, you make an eye that is slightly bigger. So this is a sensitized background. Now we take this fly and we cross it with all kinds of mutations in a genome-wide fashion, about 60% of the genome. That's the collection of flies we have. Um, and you can actually see that we can identify many things. Here's, whoops, here's wingless again. Uh, we can identify many things that even Joel Rosenbaum, who has no clue about uh, flies, can see that this is not normal. I mean, it's a big, uh, 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 it's a big uh, thing. I, I wouldn't, you know what that is anyway. Uh, so, but again, uh, once again, if we look at the numbers that we're getting, that 200 modifier, uh, they, some of them are actually quite interesting. 37 of those that are actually metastatic. So you uh, have it in the eye, and then you can actually see that every now and then uh, you see eye tissue uh, in other parts of the body. And it looks as if it, I mean, if you do the analysis, that it is true metastasis. I mean, uh, if you look now again, what are these genes? All over the place. Everything, I mean, no, no rhyme and reason. They all, always, in spite of the fact that it's overexpression and so on, uh, you always get the right suspects. I mean, all the right suspects in terms of known modulators of notch activity. Okay? Really? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it is a circular argument. Yes. I, I, I don't, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, so, uh, the, if you look at all the, the, the uh, gene, the, you know, the, the uh, screens that I told you, what you see is there is, ap there is very little overlap, really, all right? Now, whether this is because it is a, uh, a genes that, uh, you know, this is tissue-specific, whether it's path, I don't know. But the fact is that this core pathway that I showed you in the beginning, there are many, many ways that you can actually uh, influence it. So this is not simplicity, this is not specificity, this is huge pliotropy. Is there any hope in, uh, in, uh, in this? Um, well, we, uh, in an attempt to try and decobolate at least some of that, uh, what we have been doing uh, is we have tried to look at protein uh, 
the proteome. Uh, they, what we wanted to do, uh, for better or for worse, uh, is to look at protein interactions, define complexes uh, in proteins, and then try to connect this physical map with the genetic map in an attempt to deconvolute at least some of this uh, complexity. So uh, what, we, uh, what we started to do a few years ago was heroic and stupid maybe, or, or, or uh, mindless. Uh, and that is to take, uh, take genes, take uh, proteins, tag them, express them in cells, bring down the complexes, define uh, what they interact with, and then sort of bioinformatically uh, put everything together. Uh, the first installment of this has been published a, a couple of few years ago uh, in flies, and uh, this is the, the so-called hairball, all right, uh, which I will describe to you in excruciating detail in a second. <laughs> um, but uh, the, uh, and we are just about finished, actually, uh, doing the entire map, uh, which has about 10,000 proteins that we have tagged, expressed, and did all this, uh, this work. A lot of work and, uh, and uh, a lot of caveats, but this is a baseline. We have checked a number of things, and I'll come to that in a second. And in parallel, uh, together with, uh, with uh, Wade Harper and Steve Gee, my colleagues at Harvard, we're doing the human proteome. Again, this, has, uh, this, has a set. this is even worse. Uh, uh, this has also now d finished. So we're putting all of that stuff together. And of course, the most interesting part, and this is why we used to compare the two, is to what degree these are comparable, all right? So what is the volume of the experiment? Yes, about 10,000, yeah. It's a lot of work, uh, but, but. <laughs> um, just to give you an example in terms of knots, again, going back to this. Um, if you look at uh, these, uh, the, uh, the, the complexes that I showed you in the hairball, the colors are actually geo uh, terms. So these colors are, putting together proteins that have been, have similar functions within, in, in terms of GO. Uh, these are a few, uh, a few uh, complexes that contain modifiers from any one of the screens that I showed you. Uh, and uh, we're looking at modifiers, at the complexes that have at least uh, have a 50% enrichment. So 50% of the proteins have been associated genetically uh, with NOTS. Many of these, this was the first time that there were these associations were made. And if you ask the question that uh, how many of these, um, how many of these of the remaining proteins in a particular complex that have never been associated with knots, whether or not they interact with knots, the answer is yes, that they do. So there is a good predictability of the map as far as, uh, 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 that, that, that's far. Of course, the most interesting part is starting yeah. now after almost seven years of very, very hard work. Um, and that is part of this, uh, this hairball, if you will. And what we're trying to do uh, is look now at the dynamics of that, uh, of that map. So looking at uh, changing genetic uh, context as well as drug context. So if you take a cell and you put in a particular drug in high concentrations, low concentrations, and look at now these relationships, how they change and if they change, in, uh, in uh, using quantitative uh, uh, proteomics, sort of use isobaric labeling and look at also at the quantities of the, of the relative uh, uh, members. Uh, this is something that, uh, that we're just started doing. So and it's more yes. Pairwise interaction? In other words, the yeah. species is involved is getting even more complicated? Well, we just what, what we, I'll, I'll, one, one, I'll tell you what, one second here. So if you take one particular complex, there are two, com th two questions that we're asking. If you disrupt members of that complex, what happens to the complex? Does it collapse or not? If it does collapse, for example, I mean, I'm just giving, is what happens to the, or, or to the next door neighbors? What happens to the system? Because if you, can you find essentially nodes that will, when disrupted, you can actually disrupt the system? You, do that by DNA, you, can't by biochemistry. you can actually do that by biochemistry if you have a specific question. And we are doing that in, in, cer in certain circumstances, yes. So, so who yeah. Who is doing all these steps? You do multiple steps of the experiment for each one? Each of the 10,000 proteins, it's, this, these are all overexpression experiments. Yeah. All. How do you know the multiple steps? By doing the biology. Yeah, so 
You've got to speak up with the question because I have. No, the question, they, the question is a classic question, uh, and that is how do, these are overexpression experiments, and how do we know that these are relevant, essentially, right? How do you know that these are, which is a totally reasonable question. Uh, and it's only the, through the looking at the biology of particular uh, interactions that you can actually see whether or not this is relevant or not. So if I have a complex that has one target, which is not, let's say, all right, and this interacts with four other proteins, if I, know, if I see that this modifier of notch is modified by these proteins as well, I suspect that this is probably something real. Have you done a titration experiment, level of expression versus connectivity? Uh, no. That's what you need to do. I'm aware of that, but you know, this is 10,000 proteins <laughs> and, uh, and seven years of work. You start with one or two at a time. Oh yeah, one or two at a time. You have, that's, that's a given. I mean, we've done that, obviously, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to say anything. And this is the baseline, yes. Now, to what degree the, the overexpression affects uh, the overall map, I cannot tell you. But I can tell you that uh, the, the only way that you can actually do that, I mean, so, you know, uh, except the, what you just said, which is impossible to do, um, is to look at particular complexes as revealed by that map and as, suggest, uh, as this map suggests functionality between a, a particular interaction and just look at the biology. There's no other way of doing it. And every time we've, sun, we've done that, uh, it has actually proven to be okay. So, so the, uh, the predictability of the map, I'm sure there are things there that are not correct, uh, but the predictability of the map is actually uh, uh, quite astonishing. Yeah. Correct. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and for us, yeah, the, the, the genetic interaction, the existence of a genetic, if, if the map says that A interacts with B, if, if that, if that, and if we show functionally that A interacts with B in vivo, then that's a good enough. Uh, 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 they actually agree most of the time in the case of Notch where we have looked at it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I can't believe it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, if especially with transcription factors and so on, it's, I mean, uh, if you overexpress something, you do get artifacts, and no doubt about it. No doubt about it, yeah. So, the base map is in Drosophila cell culture, uh, as is the human one. And there are different strains for each protein that is run by GAL4? Is that for the idea? Different strains of each protein. What do you mean? I mean, for each protein you want to test, you have to have a different construct for the GAL4, UAS, and so on. The, the protein interaction map is done in a different way, right? I mean, you take the, the protein, you tag it, and you express it in, uh, in cells, right? Yeah, but you have to have, how do you express it in cells? Don't yeah, you, you, drive, you drive it with GAL4. Yeah, but is it in, an integrated, um, you just... I get you, your you, question. You, I'm okay. not notoriously smart, so please, please, uh, you know, try and, you know... Are you adding, perhaps you're adding a... Sorry, sorry. sorry. No, I mean, these are, this is, so you get one protein, you express it in the how cell. How do you express it? On a vector? On a virus? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What do you hope to come out of this? In terms of what? Biology. I think that is biology. I'm you sorry to say, you, you know. Learn about biology, that's the question. Interactions. I mean, you are going to learn about how, how complex the system is put together. What are the, what A interacts <coughs> with what? <coughs> I mean, the fact that you have two things that are interacting together because of a biochemical experiment, the question is in vivo how this interaction is modulated. But you have to do a titration experiment for all those interactions, putative interactions. Well, could, I make a, could I make yeah, a suggestion? In some cases Spiros? you do. Spiros, over here. Okay, I will bet. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
all of the, all of the pathways, signaling pathways, initially, oh, whether it's hedgehog or when, are defects in those pathways result in defects in the way the system differentiates. Seven figures instead of five. Uh, the tubu tubules in the mammary glands don't branch correctly. The bones uh, don't elongate properly or, or get too long or be too short. So they result in problems in differentiation. Those problems boil down to tissues that are not developing correctly. For example, in the mammary gland, they're not making branches. The, the kidney, they won't be forming proper proximal and distal tubules. Those all are cell-cell interactions. So finally, my question. If you have, and notch is at the core of a lot of these signaling pathways. So if you have two cells and the cell-cell interaction is so important to get the proper differentiation of a tube, a sheet, fingers, and so forth. What, when you have notch on the surface, how does that cell tell the, let's say, the adjacent cell, I have notch here, interact with me with DX or uh, your receptor? What is the signaling between one cell to another? Because that cell interaction initially is what's going to determine the, the proper structure? The, the initial interaction is a physical interaction between the ligand and the receptor on the surface of the how cell. How does the receptor, how does that cell say, hey, how do you uh, determine that cell has yeah. the proper receptor on it? You've got notch here. It's going to react with another cell with a receptor. Is there signaling between the notch-containing cell and the cell it's going to interact with its surface to say, okay, we'll join. Yeah, there is a transendocytosis. Uh, the ligand touches the receptor. The receptor is cleaved, and the extracellular part goes into the receiving cell, into the sending cell, and the intracellular part of, uh, of the, uh, the, the notch-expressing cell, let's say, goes into the nucleus and starts transcription. There's a large literature that's developing now on ectosomes, small vesicles that come out of one cell and go to close by, close, close signaling to an adjacent cell. We, say, okay, yeah. we have looked at that very. Interact with us. Yeah, we've looked at that uh, and we have no evidence for that. I know, I mean, that's, that's uh, we, uh, we have looked at this. We have found no evidence so far. Could I suggest a, a simple experiment? Well, no, in that case. Okay, could I suggest a simple experiment with, with your resources? Poof, we can do in two weeks. <laughs> so the idea, you can... If it's a good experiment. Oh, it's perhaps, a great experiment. Yeah. Go ahead. Unfortunately, yeah. we'll yeah, go ahead. eliminate all this. Try it. Okay, so you can easily scan genomes and find out where all the enhancers are. Okay, you overexpress notch, I guarantee you, it's going to make all kinds of new enhancers. You'll have all kinds of nonspecific, quote unquote, effects. So then how can you trust the results? What results exactly? The, all your results, which are, which are based on assuming specificity, where it's probably not specific you know, because it's overproduced. You have a pleiotropic pathway that affects. But, yeah, of course, no, no. The pathway can become pleiotropic. It's one of my. So I'm trying to say by over no, no, by overexpression. You just got all you got in the cell. Mark. No, you can do it by titration. Well, yeah, but that's hard. I'm telling you very simply. But anyway, yeah. all you've got, all these pathways have the same thing, right? Kinases and blah blah, and they can talk to each other. And you, over, you know, it's what happens in cancer. You overproduce somebody, and it works on a different pathway. That doesn't mean those are real, quote unquote, ordinary interactions. It doesn't solve any biological problem except that you, the output we're measuring is a biological output, right? So the question is, how can you influence that biological output and whether or not this biological output can be modulated by what, okay? 
So you can actually say that you have one element that can influence that, but if there are a hundred elements, then how do they do that? I, I interpret Mark's results oppositely to Mark, that you're saying that the specificity doesn't matter very much, so you have three amino acids and it's going to turn this on. No, no, and, no. Ep microphone. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, in a way, yes, yes, yes. But, <laughs> but these weak interactions, for example, when you activate in bacteria, off DNA, they're extremely weak. On DNA, and you get, you know, what is activation? It's just a, a chemist wouldn't notice. That, that, it's a factor of 10 or 100. Okay? That's what he's saying. That well, no, something. no, but if you overexpress, for example, it's, an activator, you do all over kinds of things. But you're, you're missing but you, a very fundamental point, all right? And that is that if you overexpress, it is an artificial, if you will, experiment. But if this artificial experiment gives you uh, answers that are relevant, well, then and they are relevant. I'm questioning whether those are really relevant. No, but the relevant answer is a biology. You know, it's not the biochemistry. I'm afraid. Relevant is a consequence in a in a in a, in a biological output. That's what relevant is, per definition. The question is how you test that biological outcome. The what?